That's a riveting clip, isn't it? <laughs> How many people know where that's from? Yeah, it's the London Tube. It's the UK system of subway. And in 1969, they needed to start making that announcement because they created a track on a curve, and there was a foot gap between the platform and the train. And so they were calling attention to this gap. Mind the gap. And there are plenty of places in our lives where we try to mind the gap. Now, keep in mind, gap and minding it means that you have to have two independent realities and a space in between. And we have gaps in our lives everywhere. Uh, one popular one would be our teeth, braces. So you can see this picture here, the headgear, this guy. There was not a chance I was going to show you me when I was a little girl with braces and headgear. And clearly people go to an enormous effort to mind that gap because what on earth was she wearing? <laughs> Right? And I had headgear as a kid. I had the one with like the little thing on top and the thing that comes down here. And I remember trying to eat pudding and my mom was like totally disgusted and it was great. But we have other places in our lives where we mind the gap. Our finances. We say that we have our income and our expenses. And we even have language that talks about minding the gap. We say, I have got to make ends meet. Right? And we have many places in our lives where we have gaps. And for the next three weeks, we are going to be taking a look at what I would think is three of the most important gaps as it means to be a human being. The gap between us and God, we're talking about that today. The gap between us and others, we're talking about that next week. And then the third week, we're going to talk about the gap within ourselves. And we're focusing ourselves today on the gap between us and God. And I think we need to start there because if we don't, it's going to be impossible for us to really process and examine the gap we have with other people and the gap we have within ourselves. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be taking a look at the gap between us and God. Now, Brooks did a great job in the spring in the Who Am I series, speaking specifically about how Scripture addresses this gap. And you'll see in your notes there, there's a, just a shout out to that message. It's called Beautiful But Broken. It was in the Who Am I series. It's the second one. And I would encourage everyone to go back to that because this really does build on that concept. But he explains that scripture talks about this beautiful, perfected way of being at one time. That we were created by our loving Heavenly Father to experience life perfectly. No pain, no death, no sadness. We were to live in full and pure devotion to Him. And that was what our life was to be like. We were to have joy and peace and love and know no sadness. But we clearly have this gap in our experience, don't we? Here's a slide that talks a little bit about some of that gap. You can see it in your, uh, on the screen. There's perfection and there's brokenness. And there's this gap that exists. The gap includes things like death and greed and anger and rejection and confusion and fear and insecurity and anxiety, despair, guilt, and unhappiness. We don't have to look very far in our own lives and the lives of others and the world around us to know that there is this significant gap between God's perfect plan, perfect way of creating things, and the broken state that we're in now. If I look at my own life, I can just think of the last 24 hours. This morning, I woke up, I was feeling a little achy. And immediately, I was reminded in the first second of my day that my body is in a state of decay. I'm aging. I'm a little creaky in the mornings. This is not how I was created. This isn't perfect. This is broken. Yesterday, I was at a farmer's market, and I was getting really cheesed off at all the dogs that were walking around in front of me. And I like dogs, but... I, it was like a farm, it was like a zoo in this street, and I was just getting ticked off at all these people with their dogs, and can't you control your dog? And I was like unnecessarily getting cheesed off, right? There was this sort of anger in me. This past week, I became jealous of a coworker and felt really insecure with who I was and what I had to offer. So we don't have to look very far to realize that we have this gap, this brokenness. And scripture is very clear in describing this gap. Scripture calls this gap sin. Sin is missing the mark off of God's best design and best plan for us. And we are full of sin. And the only person who is able to bridge that gap is Jesus. He rescues us. So that's what we're focusing on today. Let's, let's talk a little bit about rescue, this concept of rescue for a minute. Now rescue is 
only as dramatic as the need for it. So we know people who seemingly have a high need for rescue, even though they don't really need rescued, and we call them divas or hypochondriacs or something, right? But the need for rescue is directly correlated to the type of rescue and the impact of rescue. So you can see on the slide here, there's the axis, low to high, need for rescue, low to high, type and impact. And the first type of rescue we're going to talk about is this low need for rescue, which results in sort of a low type of rescue. I'm going to give you an example. Last summer, I was gardening, uh, middle of the day, no shoes, hair everywhere, dirty clothes. I was going at it in the garden, and I locked myself out of my house, and I didn't have my cell phone. So I thought, well, how am I going to be rescued from this? I don't know anybody's number. I don't memorize. The only number I know is my folks and this office. So even if I go to a neighbor, I'm not sure who I'm going to call. I certainly don't remember the name of the number who has my key. So I ended up going to the neighbor's house. They were there, and I figured it out. That rescue was a pretty low need, and it was a pretty low rescue. Someone came over and opened my house. But if I hadn't, um, the neighbor hadn't been there, if my uh, if it was winter, if I had my bathing suit on, I mean, that would have been a significant need for rescue, right? So you can see how the more your need for rescue, the higher the impact, the type of rescue is required. The next type of rescue, let's take a look. Okay, a little bit higher need, a little bit higher impact. Perhaps you are stranded on the side of the road and you're flat tire or you're out of gas. Now, some of you may say that's not that big of a deal. For me, that would be a big deal. And if I was in a different country and I didn't speak the language, it would increase and so would my need for rescue, or if I was in a sketchy part of town in the middle of the night. So you can see how that correlates. And then finally, there's this other type of rescue, and it is where it's very, very high need for rescue, but the type of impact that's required is significant and dramatic, and so is the impact. And this is the life and death type of rescue. I don't know how many of you remember the Chilean miner disasters, who they were, they were trapped, right? Dozens of miners were trapped miles below the surface for days and days and days. And it was life and death for them. Or the Sri Lankan woman who was buried in the rubble for 17 days after the building collapsed in an earthquake. You know, if it had been two or three days, it would have been dramatic. But 17 days, I mean, we're talking very significant need for rescue, and the type of rescue that was required was dramatic. So let's just take a little peek at dramatic rescues and the characteristics of them. They always deal with life and death. They save the completely vulnerable. They have rescuers putting themselves in danger. They require putting trust and faith in the rescuer. If those miners never decided to put faith in what was happening to rescue them, they'd still be there. The dramatic rescue, it is something that we could never do for ourselves, and it frees us up to have a life of purpose and meaning. When those miners came to the surface and saw daylight for the first time, it immediately freed them up for a new life of meaning and purpose because they were counting the hours and they knew that their life of meaning and purpose was coming to an end. So this is the nature of dramatic rescues. Now you and I are most likely never going to be trapped in a Chilean mine. We're not going to be buried under the rubble in Sri Lanka. But you and I will never experience a more dramatic rescue than the one that Jesus does to save us from our sin, to save us from that gap, to save us from this brokenness, this decay that takes us away from how we really were intended to live and experience a full life. There's so much scripture that points to this. In fact, the whole story of scripture is Jesus on his rescue mission for us. And so I actually had a really hard time picking which verse we're going to look at, but we're going to look at a few today, and you can pull out your notes because you can see Galatians 3, verse 13. It says this, but Christ has rescued or redeemed us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. Now, Paul the Apostle Paul, who's writing this letter to the Corinthian, or to, yeah, to, sorry, to the Galatians, he is specifically using this very specific word. And in the Greek, that word rescued is ex agardazo. And it's really two words put together ex meaning out, and agardazo meaning marketplace or slave market in some translations. And so you can see in your notes there, the definition really when you put those words together is to redeem by payment of a price and recover from the power of another. 
That last part's important, to recover from the power of another. Another way of saying it, you see in your notes there, the buyer or the redeemer is going to the slave market to purchase a slave for the solitary purpose of bringing him out of that place to be set free. So when Paul uses that word, he's trying to give the Galatian church a sense that Jesus is the buyer. Jesus is the redeemer and the rescuer, and he is going to the place where you are enslaved, where you are in bondage, and he's going there for the solitary purpose of paying a price, his own life, to bring you out of that place of slavery into a place of freedom. That is significant, and that's what that verse is all about. There's other verses in Scripture we're going to take a look at. We'll pull, throw them up on the screen. Romans 3, 22 through 25. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and we're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. 1 John 4, 9 and 10. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. There are many other verses in scripture that talk about this rescue, and you're gonna be processing that in home church this week. There's one other verse I wanna share. It's probably one of the most popular verses in scripture. You see it at sporting events. If you grew up in the church, it's probably the first verse you ever learned, John 3, 16. And as I was looking at different translations and commentaries, I wanted to find a verse that sort of jolts us out of our regular pattern of hearing this, because it's sort of rote and we know it by memory. And so I chose the, the version called The Message. It's a paraphrased version, so here we go. John 3, 16 and 17. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one needs to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. I love that last part. God did not send Jesus to send an accusing finger, shame on you for this massive gap that exists between the way I designed you to live wholly and perfectly for me and the way that you're experiencing life now. Shame on you. No, that is not what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to save us because he loves us and to make everything right again. But it's because he was motivated by love. There really is no more significant, more dramatic rescue than that. So when you see it there, again, it is no more dramatic than this, saving us from our own impending death. One of my favorite passages in scripture is when Paul talks to the Corinthian church about the resurrection of Jesus. And he says this to the Corinthian church. He says, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Death has been swallowed up in victory. There is nothing more significant than that. I want and need to believe in a God who has the capacity to defeat death because I'm not interested in any other God than that. And I need a God who can rescue me from death, not because he's obliged to, but because he loves me. And that is what this rescue is all about. Let's take a look at what rescue feels like. You can see this chart. Without God, it really is like slavery. Scripture often talks about how we're enslaved and in bondage to sin. But with God's rescue, it's a totally different picture. Without God, it's death. And with God, it's life. 
Without God, it's rejection, and with God, it's love. Where there was once fear, there is now freedom. Anger has turned to peace, insecurity, confidence, despair, hope, greed, generosity. Where there was confusion, there's clarity. Anxiety, there's patience, guilt, forgiveness, unhappiness, and now there is joy. It sort of feels like an amen moment. (laughs) This is what the rescue is about. This is what's so compelling. This is why we call it good news. This is the rescue. Now, some of you are looking at that list and you're saying, well, Krista, I actually have accepted the rescue of Jesus, but my life still has places of despair and confusion and fear and sadness, and my entire life isn't made up of joy and peace. I was talking with Tim Day, our senior pastor this week. I'm not gonna take credit for this because this is his nugget of wisdom. He said, you know, Krista, I was rescued, I am being rescued, and I will be rescued. I was rescued, I am being rescued, and I will be rescued. And when scripture talks about this rescue and this saving grace that we've been given, it really is all-encompassing. It's once and for all, Jesus, I want this rescue, I accept this rescue, and I am saved. But he continues to save me even in these moments through the work of his spirit. And one day, everything will be fully consummated. There will be no more death, no more fear, no more unhappiness, no more pain. I was rescued. I am being rescued. I will be rescued. Those Chilean miners, when they were trapped, they were in desperate need of a rescue and the entire world flocked to Chile. There were engineers, there were doctors, there were, there were so many people who were involved with the rescue. And while they were doing it because they wanted to rescue these people, they were doing it in many ways because it was their duty. It was their obligation. I mean, many of them would have gotten paid to come to Chile and figure this mess out. But that is not the motivation for God to save us and to rescue us. It's because he loves us. And he doesn't just love us, it's a suffering kind of love. And in our own human DNA, that sort of love really resonates deeply within us. We feel compelled by a suffering love. It's the most beautiful kind of love. And so as I was thinking like, how do we we process that and look at that this morning? The first thing that came to mind was this beautiful story of Rick and Dick Hoyt. I don't know if you know this story, But this is a father and a son. Rick Hoyt was born with cerebral palsy. And when he turned 15 years old, he asked his father, could we please go and run a race? And since then, they've run over 1,000 marathons, Ironmans, triathlons. And it's a beautiful story of a father who will do anything for his son. So let's take a look at this. It is a beautiful, beautiful image of a father out of his great love, suffering and going to great lengths for his son. That is just just a glimpse of what God our Father does for us. He goes to great lengths. He's willing to suffer for us. And he is all about taking what is broken and painful and not how it should be and setting us free to live the life that we really were intended to live. And he does this only through Jesus. That is how this gap is bridged. Take a look at your takeout in your notes. There isn't one single thing I can do to bridge the gap that exists between me and God. It is a pure gift because I am eternally and passionately loved by God. That is why Jesus came to rescue me. And as he pursues me, all I need to do with faith is let love in. All I need to do, all you need to do, all we need to do is with faith, let love in. So you might be asking, well, how do I let love in? And the reality is, The answer to that question really depends on where you land with what you've just heard. 
So I think there's probably about four groups of people, types of people, who are listening in to this message. The first group of people are people who are listening to this message and are saying, I don't really understand this. I don't really believe it. And if I'm really being honest with you, Krista, it, it actually sounds really crazy. Because you're talking about a guy who 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross and then was like rose to life. Like this is all very, very strange. And, and I just don't believe it. And I would just say to you that even if you don't understand it today, and even if you don't believe it today, it doesn't make it any less true. Because I have met many people who at one point in their life, they felt that very same thing. And then they came in touch with this need for dramatic rescue in their life, and their minds and hearts changed on all of these things. So I would just invite you to stay open and know that this place called the Meeting House is a very safe place to do that. You do not need to sit here and believe this stuff. But be open. There's another group of people, and you're hearing this, and it deeply resonates with you. You are saying to yourself, I know that there's this gap that exists. I am not living this way that I was created to live. And there is full of junk in my experience of life. It is hard, it is painful, and I want to live my life wholly devoted to God, and I can't. And I need this rescue of Jesus. And so what do I do now? And the good news is, you don't have to do anything more. You just have to accept this rescue. Jesus, in faith, I, I believe this rescue and I want this rescue. And if this is you, I would encourage you to talk to somebody. Talk to me. Talk to one of the pastors across all of our sites. Talk to someone who actually is following Jesus as has experienced this rescue before. It really is the most important decision that you'll make. Now there's a third group, and this is the group that's like way on the other end of the spectrum. We kind of call them Jesus freaks, okay? They are the people who are so in touch with the personal rescue that they've received that they can't stop talking about it. They're passionate. And maybe it's because they've experienced a dramatic transformation in their life, or this rescue has been quite recent, and they have experienced this freedom that comes and they just want to talk about it. And for those of us at the Meeting House, here's a message for us. Cozy up to those people, because they have got something that many, many of us have lacked. They are in touch with a fundamental truth that we all need to get back in touch with, and I'm grateful for those people. And then there's the fourth group, and I'm putting myself in the fourth group, and I'm willing to bet about 75 or 80% of those of us who call the Meeting House home fall into this group. At one point in our lives, we actually have experienced this dramatic rescue. It maybe wasn't this massive life transformation, but we have accepted this rescue of Jesus, and we have been living as a follower of Christ. But we have lost the sense of how dramatic this rescue is in our life, and our lives are reflective of that. Mike Krause last week, he said, if people aren't asking you about Jesus, it's because you're probably not living radical enough. Well, part of that is because we haven't been intrinsically motivated to do anything differently. We've lost touch with the dramatic nature of this rescue. Sameness often leads to numbness. And what are we going to do this week to try and shake us up? You know, those Chilean miners, the only way that they could stay in touch with their rescue, because chances are years and years later, they're not talking about the rescue every conversation like they would have. But the only way that they're gonna stay in touch with the dramatic nature of their own rescue is to participate in rescuing other trapped miners. We have this invite goal. 100,000 people personally invited to hear about this rescue of Jesus, resulting in thousands of people accepting the rescue and being baptized. If we want to stay in touch with our own rescue, we are being invited by God to participate with him in helping to rescue other people. That's how we stay in touch. So this week we're going to be spending some time, how do we get in touch with the dramatic nature of our own rescue for those of us who have accepted this before. We're going to do something different today, and we're going to do it through it the whole series. Across all of our sites, we're going to sing a song together, and this same song is actually going to be sung in our musical worship over the next two weeks. Now, musical worship is a fantastic way for us to declare together with other people who have been rescued, I 
I'm rescued, and I'm so grateful, God, that I'm rescued. That's what musical worship is all about. I'm going to ask the team to come on out, and we're going to be um, sharing this song together. Jesus has done everything for us. He has bridged this gap in dramatic ways. I want to invite all of you to stand. We're going to be using the words on the screen, but it's also in your notes. And we're going to be singing through this song, and then I'll come up and close in prayer. rescued us. You are rescuing us, and you will rescue us, and we are so grateful for that. Father, my prayer is that for each one of us, we take our next step to let you in, to let love in, to let this rescue permeate our lives. Father, we pray for many, many people 
who are making decision even right now to accept this rescue. God, we thank you that you pursue us passionately because you love us. God, we continue to submit our lives to you. We want it to be declaring that you have rescued us. Help us to do that every day. We love you so much, Father, and we pray this in your name. Amen.